Hey everyone, Chase Frazy here, and we've got another message for you today. But before we get to that, we got a few announcements. Because of some technical difficulties, there will be four messages we will not be posting on our YouTube page. But you can go check out the live stream at our Facebook page at First Apostolic Church of Arthur. Uh, those dates were May 27th, Sister Frazy's uh, study of Acts Part 6. May 31st was our drive-in service, so you can go watch the live stream there. And uh, June 3rd was Sister Frazy's study of Acts Part 7. And June 7th was uh, Pastor's Sunday morning message. So make sure to go check those out if you want to uh, watch them. Um, we are currently testing new ways to make your audio listening and live stream watching um, experience even better than what it is now. Um, also, go check out our website at www.facarthur.org. And before you leave our YouTube page, hit like and subscribe so when we do post new content, you'll get informed. So without further ado, here is Sister Crazy's study of Acts Part 8. I hope you enjoy. study of the book of Acts. Are you getting tired of the book of Acts yet? <laughs> good, because there is a lot of good stuff to glean, especially in the day that we're living in. Uh, we're going to be in uh, Acts chapter 13 and chapter 14 tonight. And chapter 13, be we start out at the church of Antioch in Syria. And uh, there were some prophets and teachers in that church, uh, one of whom we are aware of is, is Barnabas. Then we hear of Simeon, who was uh, called the black man, uh, Lucius, and Minoan, I believe is how you pronounce it, and Minoan was a, a childhood friend of King Herod Antipas. Now these, these four men were well looked upon by the church. They were uh, leaders in the church there at Antioch in Syria. They were prophets. They were teachers. They were the ones that God depended on to help the church grow, to lead and direct the church. These men were doing as they should. They were worshiping and fasting. Oh, my, what happens when we start worshiping and fasting? Well, the same thing that happened to them. The Holy Ghost fell upon them and, and spoke to them and told them to separate Barnabas and Paul for a special work, a special work. Uh, and after some more fasting and prayer, they anointed these two men and sent them on their way. Uh, and this begins the first missionary journey of Paul. Uh, in, throughout this study, you're going to learn of three missionary journeys that Paul took. And uh, so we're on the first one. So they left the seaport at Seleucia and headed for Cyprus. Their first stop is in Salamis. When they stopped in Salamis, they preached the gospel in the Jewish synagogues. And in that section of, of scripture, they make mention that John Mark went with them as an assistant. Now, you may think, what was the relevance of that? Well, just hang on. Later in our studies down the road, you're going to find out some more about John Mark. Uh, from that stop at Salamis, they moved on, and their second stop was at Paphos. And there they met a Jewish sorcerer named Eliamus. He was also known as Bar-Jesus. Uh, you'll see both names there in the scripture. Uh, they, I think they first mentioned Bar-Jesus, but they called him Eliamus. Um, and he was very close to the governor, uh, Sergius Paulus. And Sergius Paulus wanted to hear 
the word of the Lord from Paul and Barnabas. But, you know, as usual, the devil doesn't want you to hear the word of the Lord. And he will try to bring every distraction that he can. And so Eliamus was that distraction for Sergio. Eliamus interfered because he didn't want the governor to become a believer. And if you look in verses 10, we're going to read verses 10 through 12. Uh, actually, I'm going to bump up to verse 9. It says, then Paul, who was also called, it says Saul, who was also called Paul, <laughs> um, was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he set his eyes on him, speaking of Eliamus. And he said, O oh, full of all subtility and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hands of the Lord is upon thee, that thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the law. The very thing that Eliamus the sorcerer was trying to prevent from happen, happening, he actually aided in. Okay? Because of him rising up against Paul and Barnabas, God put a curse on him, and he lost his sight, just as Paul had said would happen. And what would you think if you were the governor watching this take place? You would realize that these men aren't just lying. They're not just telling some fable, but what they have is a real thing. And because of that, he became a believer. The next stop that we come across, the third stop, what, after they left Paphos, was they went to Perga in Pamphylia. And there we see John Mark again. John Mark leaves them to return to Jerusalem. Now, again, why are they bringing up John Mark leaving there? Well, Further down the line, you're going to see something that takes place, and it will open your understanding to that. Nothing else is mentioned in this sec section uh, about the stop in uh, Perga. So they go on. They're neck, I mean, outside of uh, John Mark leaving them. That was about the only thing that was mentioned there. Uh, stop four. They traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia. Now, this is, the, this is a different Antioch from the one where Paul and Barnabas had come from. Paul and Barnabas came from Antioch of Syria, but this is Antioch of Pisidia. They, first thing they do when they go to town is they go to the synagogue. When you travel to a different town, is that the first place you go to? The church? Well, I tell you what, the way the work of the Lord grew during this time, we might want to rethink where we stop first when we go into a town <laughs> because they had great success. They went to the synagogue, and, and they take a seat, and they listen as uh, the books, the readings from the books of Moses took place. And then those who were in charge of the service, I don't know if they recognized Paul and Barnabas. The scripture doesn't tell us. But somehow they recognized them as being teachers. I don't know if it was a garment they wore. The scripture just doesn't tell us what caused them to ask. But those in charge of the service ask if Paul and Barnabas had a word of exhortation. Now, Every preacher I've ever met, all you got to do is say, do you have a word? And buddy, they usually have one. 
They have something to say. And Paul and Barnabas was not any different. They had a message. They had a message of the name of Jesus. They had a message of salvation. And they began to preach that Acts 2.38 sermon again. You remember the Acts chapter 2 sermon that, that Paul, or that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost? It's the same message that we keep seeing all throughout the book of Acts. And if you'll read through that whole sermon, you'll see they take them again from the beginning of their heritage. They take them way back to when God delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians. He takes them straight on through to the conquering of the land of Canaan. He takes them through every part of their history and brings them right up to Jesus and the crucifixion and the resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. So they exhorted, they preached Jesus. Once the Jews had left the service, the Gentiles asked if, if Paul and Barnabas would come back the next Sabbath and, and speak again. So many Jews and Gentiles believed and followed Paul and Barnabas, and they did stay, and they did preach the following uh, Sabbath. And when they got there, <laughs> it wasn't just the regulars in service. The whole city showed out, showed up to hear what Paul and Barnabas had to say. But you know, anytime you have God start moving, the enemy starts moving as well. He's going to try and discourage. He's going to cause, try to cause some ripple effects. And so the same in, as in this revival, the enemy rears his ugly head, and there were some Jews who became envious of what was happening through Paul and, si uh, Paul and Barnabas. And they spake against them. And if you look at verses 46 through 48, it says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you have put it from you and, and judge yourselves unworthy for everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. They, the Jews had stirred up some people during this time and they probably didn't much like that sermon or that exhortation that Paul and Barnabas just gave them and so they again decided we got to do something do you remember how the Jews did with Jesus before the crucifixion they were constantly trying to stir something up to turn people against him it was happening again with the apostles. You know what? If you think it's any different today, you've got another thing coming. There's going to be those who are going to receive the word with gladness, and there are going to be some who's going to fight the church tooth and toenail to try to discourage, to try to bring an end. So the Jews stirred up some devout and honorable women, it said and the chief men of the city. And Paul and Barnabas were just run out of town. You're not welcome here anymore, Paul and Barnabas. But you know what? They were too late running Paul and Barnabas out of town because already now there's an established church. They shook the dust off their feet and moved on. And you will notice a little bit later they're going to go back there 
So being run out of town, we can't let that stop us from sharing the gospel when there's a hungry heart. We can't allow the world to, to frighten us or to subdue us. We've got to share the gospel. We move on to chapter um, 14. And our fifth stop we find is in Iconium. Iconium. And when they got there, again, where did they go? They went to the synagogues and they began to preach this gospel message. And there were Jews and there were Greeks who believed. But once again, those unbelieving Jews, they stirred up some Gentiles to attack and to stone them. Wow. Can you imagine people of authority who get so angry at somebody that they would rise up to attack them and even stone them? Well, don't be surprised. It's happening today in our government, in our world. People of authority who are, they just hate an individual so bad they'll go to any extent to try to destroy them. Maybe not literally stone or kill them, but still to ruin a reputation, to tear them down from their positions of authority, whatever the case may be. It's a constant battle, and it still goes on today. Uh, so the apostles got word of what was going to happen, that they were going to be uh, attacked and stoned. So they fled to a town called Lyconia. And when they reached Lyconia, they went to the cities of Lystra and to Derbe. Those were the two cities that were mentioned. When they got to Lystra, they met a crippled man, a crippled man who had been crippled from birth and Paul was preaching, and that crippled man was holding on to every word that Paul preached. Every word that he preached, he was holding on to it. He was listening. And as Paul preached, he noticed this man. Out of all the people who were watching, he did notice this crippled man. And he saw his faith. He could see that man's faith increasing as he preached. And all of a sudden, the anointing of God came upon Paul, and he just said, stand up. Stand upright. And when he did that, the man leaped to his feet, the scripture says, and was healed. Now, this brought a whole new set of problems for Paul and Barnabas because the people there in Lystra, they worshipped many gods, okay? If you've ever done any study of mythology and you've heard of all the gods, well, that's what the people of Lystra, they worshipped all these different gods. And so they began to call Barnabas Jupiter, and they called Paul Mercurius because they believed they were gods. And they wanted to celebrate and they wanted to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas and worship them. But Paul and Barnabas knew that is not right. There is only one God. And so he preached to them. He told them, he says, you guys, we're just men like you. We're not gods. The one true God is in heaven, and he's the one who made all the seas and the land and the heavens and, and everything in it. He's the God to be serving, not us. We're just men. So Paul had to explain all that to them, and he preached against the mythology that they had believed in. And then here comes those Jews that did not want the gospel to go forth. They come from Antioch and Iconium, and they won 
some of the people to their side. And what did they do? They raised up a riot and they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. But you know what? Even amidst all of that, God had still established a church there in uh, Lystra. And so they began, or wait a minute, was that Derby? Oh, no, that was still Lystra. Uh, so the, ga- the believers gathered around him. Now, I, I read that. It just says that they gathered around him. It doesn't say they prayed. It didn't say anything. I, I was thinking to myself, now, did they just stand around him and look at him? Or like Morgan, poke him with a stick. Poke him with a stick. <laughs> no, I don't believe they poked him with a stick, but I believe that they gathered around him, they begin to pray. Isn't that, wouldn't that be your first response? I think that would be my first response. I believe they begin to pray. But then Paul gets up. Wow, a man who had just been stoned. He gets up. And you know what? He didn't stay, he didn't stay there. He the next morning he gets up and heads on to Derby to continue his missionary journey. That takes dedication. It didn't say he stayed a week and a half in the hospital to be nurtured back to health. And I'm telling you, he could it he couldn't have felt good after a stoning unless God did a miraculous work in his body. And he was able to get up. And him and and, um, Barnabas, they went on to their number seven stop, which was Derby. And there they preached the gospel and taught many. That's about all it tells us about Derby. But evidently they had a revival. Stop eight. They returned back to Lystra, of all places. That's where Paul just got stoned. But did he care? Was he afraid? No. He continued on. Why? Because there was a church there. It was a new church, a baby church. And they needed some teaching. They needed some instruction. And I believe that that's what God did. It says he went back to strengthen the new believers, to encourage them. They went to Lystria, they went to Iconium, and they went to Antioch again. Just kind of backtrack their journey to strengthen the new believers, to encourage them, to continue in the faith. And he warned them of the hardships that they would suffer for God. There they also ordained the elders in each church and established those works. When you start a new church, you can't just pray a few people through to the Holy Ghost and leave and expect them to know what to do from there, can you? And that's what these men of God were doing. They were establishing them because they did not want that church to fail. Stop nine, they passed through Pisidia to Pamphylia, and there they preached at Perga and at Adalia, and uh, then returned home to the church at Antioch in Syria, where God had first sent them from. There they shared the journey with the men of God that were there. And uh, they rejoiced together. If you move on into chapter 16, we come into an area that uh, was geared to help the new churches. Okay, a lot of the churches who were established were established in communities that worshipped many gods. 
okay? And the Jews, they had their strict, rigorous rule system of how people should live for God, okay? However, these new ones, they didn't know a lot of this stuff. So next week when we get into chapter 16, we're going to learn some things that, you know, the, the Jews kind of had to look at things a little differently for the Gentiles. They had to be a little more compassionate, a little more understanding. And the Gentiles had to learn to lay aside some weights, some practices that were not beneficial to them in their walk with God. Stand with me, if you will. I know this went a lot quicker than I anticipated. Um, I even looked to see if I'd skipped a page, but I didn't that I can see. But I, I want us to, to consent, continue to read on ahead in the book of Acts because there is so much that we as a church can learn from them. How they spread the gospel. They didn't have all the media that we do. They don't, didn't have the facilities that we do. A lot of them met in houses. They went from house to house and broke bread. They shared the gospel in the synagogues until they would be run out. So they had a, a real battle at getting the, the gospel across to the world. And look, we as a church today, we've got it so much easier. Even in these uncertain days that we're living in, God has given us uh, such methods to reach lost souls. We just need to put it into use. Use what God has given us to reach lost souls. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we're thankful for your word, and we're thankful, Lord, for the early church that set an example to us, Lord, that we can get this gospel into all the world. Lord, we sometimes feel overwhelmed when we look at the masses of people, and we look at the circumstances in our world around us, but God, we know that you are the mighty God, and you have it all in your control, and Lord, if we just listen to your voice and follow your leadership, God, we can reach the masses. And Lord, I pray that you would help this church to become stronger, Lord, and more sensitive as you lead us to hungry hearts. God, that we can fill this place and see many souls born into the kingdom. We thank you for it. Lord, I pray that you'll be with each one as we go our separate ways tonight. Anoint our lives and direct our paths and bring us back at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name.